Now to our top political story. Finish this sentence. 2012 is an epic matchup between President Barack Obama and... Did you say Mitt Romney? Well, the thing is, you're only partly right. President Obama and Mitt Romney's names will be on the November ballot, but the election is not really a head-to-head -head battle. President Obama will also be facing Frank Vandersloot, Paul, John Paulson, and David Koch. Who, you ask? These men are actually part of the small army of millionaires and billionaires whose names won't be on the ticket, but whose money will be determining how you think about the names that are there. Take a look at the guys shelling out at least a million each on conservative super PACs this cycle. Do you notice anything? Seriously, they look like they're straight out of central casting for the role of the man. I mean, if you were inclined to believe in conspiracy theories, and I'm not, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that these guys would be sitting around a conference table with a tumbler of fine scotch and a good cigar while they plot the outcome of the election. <laughs> But the realities of how they do and will influence our political outcomes are both stark and complicated. For the most part, they aren't giving directly to Republican candidates. They're using super PACs and other outside groups. And Politico.com reported this week that through them, they will likely spend $1 billion on November's elections for the White House and Congress. Koch-related organizations alone plan to spend $400 million for the 2012 election season, which is $30 million more more than the $370 million that John McCain raised for his entire presidential campaign in 2008. About one-third of that billion-dollar spending, some $300 million, will be under the direction of Karl Rove through his American Crossroads and Crossroads GPS. And Karl Rove might as well be the poster child for the rich white man conspiracy theory. I know, it's seductive and actually also a little disempowering to see this small group of, shall we say, diversity-challenged, uber-rich men and assume that they are buying our elections, stripping the democracy of meaningful choices and collectively acting as policy puppet masters. But here's the thing. It's way more complicated than that. What motivates a Sheldon Adelson or a Foster Freeze, or on the left, a George Soros, to throw millions into the political arena? In a global economic world where money crosses national boundaries with little more than a tap of the finger, why do these guys care so much who the president is? Or what laws govern rural counties? Or who sits on local school boards? What are their motivations? Most assume that the super rich are motivated purely by profit, that they simply want to grow and maintain their wealth. But how much does that explain about their political actions? Maybe these titans of industry simply want power for power's sake. Maybe they're ideologically driven and want to create a world that mirrors their own world views. But as we wring our hands in distress about how their money is buying our elections, maybe we should push pause on the conspiracy theories and really try to understand what is going on here. With me at the table to try to help me understand is Matea Gold, political reporter for the Los Angeles Times and the Chicago Tribune, who has been covering big money in politics, and MSNBC contributor and Nerdland friend and columnist for The Hill, Karen Finney, who is the former DNC communications director. Thanks, ladies, for being here. So, okay, in Nerdland this week, I was determined to say... I just don't believe in conspiracy theories. I'm not, you know, I, I know there's a zombie apocalypse apparently occurring in America right now. But talk to me about what are the actual motivations of the uber wealthy to engage in the political sphere in this way. You know, Rolling Stone had a great piece that showed literally down to the dollar what some of these big donors are interested in. So, for example, they've given big money not just to um, the campaigns directly, but to these super PACs, and they all have different issues. So let's say you've been sued many times because, oh, toxic cleanup. You're going to say, you know, those regulations are just crippling my business. And then, guess what? Mitt Romney will say, regulations are crippling our business. So in point being, there are a lot of these billionaires who have very specific business interests that they want to see taken care of. And essentially, it seems like they're buying those outcomes. No, it's, it seems odd to me, though, just on the question of money in that sense, that I mean, we're talking about enormous amounts of money, Millions. personally, Millions. right, that these individuals have. 
Yesterday we had the kind of disappointing job numbers, right? Ordinary American citizens are having very tight budgets, and yet we're seeing these billions, literally billion-dollar election now coming up. How should we understand sort of how important it is for our household extra hundred, two hundred, a thousand dollars that government policy might impact us versus sort of these kind of regulations that might impact the businesses? Well, I think there's no question that there's probably an array of motivations behind a lot of these folks. And some of them have specific business interests, as Karen mentioned. Some of them are very ideologically driven. And I think what it really does is put the impetus on voters this time to be even more informed about who is putting money in the election and how they're trying to influence them. And voters are really going to be bombarded, and they already have been, with ads that are being paid for by groups. And many times we don't know who's actually financing them. And so that's going to go a long ways to shaping the actual narrative of the the election and shaping what issues are being talked about. And so I think it's really changing the dynamic in a way we haven't really seen any time in our lifetime in which individuals are really powering this election and powering the debate uh, in a way that I think is altering the dynamic. So think about like with Shelley Adelson. I mean, essentially, his money ba was put before the will of the people. The will of the people said Newt Gingrich should have been out, right, right. by the voting. Yep. But what happened? Shelley said, all right, I'll give you five million. Oh, here's another five right. to keep him in. That changed the dynamic, certainly, of the Republican primary for several weeks. But again, more importantly, he was able to write a single check to overthrow the will of the voting public. Right. So I, I, have, a, I have a dirty little secret. I, <laughs> I have one percenter porn on my <laughs> iPad. That's and scary, what, I mean yeah. by, what I mean by that is I love the Forbes app, the Forbes yeah. Lists app. And yeah. so I have this, like, the 400 richest people in America app. And so I go through it and I play. And I, I'm, I'm fascinated by, like, who is John Paulson? And I can sort of click on him on my, on my Forbes app. Tied for fifth on the Forbes 400, which I spend a lot of time just trying to figure out what their motivations <laughs> might be. Tied for fifth are the Koch brothers, who are at $17.5 billion apiece. Now, what, what we were looking at is kind of the percentages that occur if you look at sort of the amount that they're going to spend for them, right, for their net worth, their $200 million, um, is what they're going to spend out of $25 billion for the net worth of an average household in America, med excuse me, median household in America. It's 96000 So that would mean for an ordinary family spending $768, right? The amount that they're spending is the same as what it would feel to us to spend $768. Who wouldn't spend right. $768 sure. to yeah. change the outcomes of American politics. Yeah, and it really shows that while these are eye-popping figures for many of us, that for folks like Sheldon Adelson or Harold Simmons, a billionaire in, in Dallas, this is just pocket change. And for them, they're really taking advantage of what has been a change in the law through several court decisions that has really amped up their influence in a way that I don't think we've ever seen before. And what I think is so fascinating is that Forbes 400 list has probably gotten more click views, you know, than it has in the last five years. They're combined. loving it, right? I mean, we have now been introduced to this cast of characters that I think the average Americans really didn't know the billionaires in America. Now we're getting to know them on, on a, you know, on a, they're kind of bold-faced names, right, in American right. politics. And people, I mean, the Koch brothers are being talked about constantly. Right. Obama and his campaign are making them part of the issue. And these, well, are, these are figures now. But, so, but let election. me ask this question. If, if, I'm a, if, I'm the, if I'm on the right and I believe the government is either sort of inept or evil, right, I want to I right. sort of drown it in the bathtub, <laughs> then doesn't the very desire to influence politics, the willingness to spend, even if it's for them basically $768, isn't that evidence that they don't think the government is so inept, so in, incapable, like that they actually do believe government has an important role because they're willing to invest in it? Well, sure, but they believe that government has a role for them. I mean, they have a specific belief about how government should function or not. I mean, and that's why I think you get a lot of this government out of our business with the exception of our, you know, female nest <laughs> yeah, in our right. bedroom and some <laughs> other right. things. Because that really becomes kind of a message frame for lower taxes, smaller government. I would argue if you look at state governments, which are a lot smaller, they're certainly not doing much better these days with being so much smaller. But sure, you know, here's the other thing, and Matea talked about this. It's the fact that essentially we will never know who some of these people are because yep. it's not just, you know, through the super PACs, they're also able, there's these shell companies or shell sort mm -hmm. of nonprofit organizations that are passed through like money laundering. So, you know, we won't even know when we're looking at some of these ads, at least when we see the Koch brothers at funded ads uh, attacking Obama on some of the um, energy issues, right. all right, you know, well, they've got energy interests and they don't like what Obama's doing. At least you have a sense of where the motivation's coming from. 
But you know, for a lot of these yeah. groups, yeah, Americans for Prosperity. I don't even, you know, oh, that sounds good. Right. It's not for prosperity. Right, right. This has been my, my kind of constant question is sort of what are the motivations, right? Because I feel like if we think that they're all just rich white men sitting around a conference table with their cigars plotting the end of democracy, then then we we feel so disempowered by that versus trying to understand how they're motivated to use the apparatus of government. Because then then that feels to me like we can start making changes in how we make structures, right? right. So that so that it, it, it shuts off the valves. And that's what Congressman Van Hollen is trying to do with legislation that would say, okay, we at least have to know who these people are. You at least have to tell mm -hmm. us who they are. What was interesting though this week at the Christian Science Monitor Breakfast, the US Chamber of Commerce said, well we might just essentially change a few things here and there in the ad and some of the wording of the ad or how we fund the ad so we can get around those kinds mm -hmm. of regulations. So in the, uh, to your point we know there's a structural problem, right. but we also have to sort of see down the road to all the ways people are going to try to even get around the fixes that we may come up with. Absolutely. Up next, free speech, freedom of the press, cheap elections. You think it was better in the past? Why the golden age of yesteryear wasn't so golden when we return. back to the dissection of all things money and politics. So, want to know when it all changed? It was the election of 1896, and Republican strategist Mark Hanna was determined to make William McKinley the next president of the United States. Hanna's now legendary quote set the tone still so crucial in politics today. There are two things that matter in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember what the second one is. <laughs> Hanna and the Republicans outspent the Democrats by a margin of 23 to 1, and William McKinley defeated William Jennings Bryant. Still with me at the table, Matea Gold from the L.A. Times, MSNBC contributor Karen Finney, and now joining us, Douglas Brinkley, presidential historian and author of the new book, Cronkite, a nearly 700-page tome on the legendary newsman and CBS anchor celebrated as the most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite. This book has given me shoulder injury <laughs> carrying it around. But I, I, I wanted to, to talk with you in part around the Cronkite moment because, you know, as you point out from the, from the first opening salvo of the text, he is this great trusted person, and yet some of the practices that Cronkite engages in are things that we now would consider criminal at worst and certainly maybe unethical at best. Matteo was saying before we went to break, this is... Uh, this money in politics is brand new. We've never seen anything like this. But I keep wondering, is that quite true? I mean, I can, I can trace back to 1896, this idea that money is driving it. Are we in a nostalgic remembrance of some good democracy in the past that actually never existed? Well, we always are. I mean, but I'm a historian, and the first rule of history is to remind ourselves that our own times are not uniquely oppressive. Hmm. And, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and that, you know, do you want to be alive when the Civil War was going on, when we had 600,000 dead? Do you want to be alive in an era in the 1950s that some people called the golden age of TV, when there was Jim Crow laws yep. throughout the South? So, and you just, you know, one word, dentistry. Right. I mean, just, you know, go to the dentist. We have modern medical miracles. So right now is probably the best time ever to be alive. If I could just say one thing, because you're a historian and talking about Mark Hanna. Hanna also said when McKinley was shot and Theodore Roosevelt came in, oh, no, that damn cowboy is president. Yep. And TR came in from 1901 to 09 and really led a progressive movement in this country. This was, you, you, you got to my, my question before I got there, which is, you know, yes, there's that story of, of money and politics coming in right there at, this, at the dawn of the, of the 20th century. But then the very next thing that happens is an enormous progressive movement, yes. a kind of good government movement, a kind of clean this sort of thing up. Let's get a different, a somewhat more populist movement. Is that possible? Are we potentially like about to go over a cliff where Americans are going to say, OK, enough. We it, live in a democracy. It's possible. But remember, T.R. got in in a fluke way. That's he was right. that, you know, for, for starters back then. And then you have to uh, organize people. I mean, the unions have to speak up. If there is a women's movement today, mm -hmm. and what is the women's movement? They've got to speak up right now. People 
people have to rise up. And in my Cronkite book, Walter Cronkite in 1988, uh, he had tried to be Mr. Objective, Mr. Center, but in 88 when Dukakis lost the presidency to George Herbert Walker Bush, Cronkite said liberals are backing away from being liberals. Hmm. And he spoke at Barbara Jordan's big party. Uh -huh. And for Barbara Jordan, Cronkite said, open up the, it sounded like a scene from Network, open up the window, scream it, I am pro-choice, I am pro-environment, I am against nuclear weapons, I am against war. So you have to have a true fighting spirit in the Democratic Party, not one that wants to constantly triangulate like it was during the Clinton years. This is interesting. We, we were looking at, on this question of people having a voice, um, again, we were looking at donors, and at this moment, President Obama's donors are still much more likely to be small donors than um, Mitt Romney. So just when you look at the numbers, and there's kind of a, a lovely pie chart of this, the, the small dollar donors, in other words, folks giving $200 or less for, Rom for Romney, it's only about 10% of folks. For Barack Obama, 45% of his donations are coming from folks who are giving under $200. Now, that may change as, as things change. We saw some of the big money liberal donors who might help to change that, Bill Maher and others. But is that, is that what we want to do, like counteract the big money with small money that increases our sense of stake? Or is that just silly? We can never get up to the Adelson level. I, I would actually make the argument, I think the Democrats would be thrilled to have more seven-figure checks <laughs> yeah, written right, right now. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I mean, and Obama really boxed himself in because he spoke very vehemently against outside money in 2008, was very critical of the Citizens United decision, and then once the advent of huge dollars really was facing his campaign, had to reverse himself. And I think we've seen that that's been very difficult to do. And a lot of Democratic donors feel just on principle very uncomfortable with the idea of giving to super PACs. Is that why is that why there's no Oprah here? Like, you know, when I, if I'm looking through my Forbes, you know, uh, my Forbes list, you know, I'm like, okay, so so then where is Oprah and where it, you know, so we've got Bill Maher there. But yeah. what about Bill Gates, who has individually maxed out his kind of, you know, 2500, but right. hasn't given to as far as we could tell to the super PACs some kind of enormous amount? No, I think that's part of it. But look, I think the, at the fundamental level, it's this idea that money is speech. That is mm. the real problem because essentially, I mean, I'll go back to the Shelley Adelson example. One guy writes a five million dollar check. I argue that's a lot more speech than the two hundred and fifty dollar donors. And even if you know a thousand of them vote, yeah. still their will was overturned by one guy writing a big check. I think that's the fundamental problem. Sure, we can have this war of I'll get big donors and you'll get big donors mm -hmm. and we'll spend lots of money, but at the end of the day. I thought the idea, you're the historian, was supposed to be one person, one vote. That's yep. why we elect people, right? That's the will of the people. That's the voice of the people. And I think the problem right now is that's not the way it's working. And I think for most Americans, I think that's why people are so frustrated, is they feel like my voice doesn't count. I mean, consider that we had record turnout last time, yep. record engagement and involvement. And yet, again, at this point, somebody with millions of dollars can essentially drown out those voices. Yeah, and I, I think that was part of what was exciting to me about 2008, sort of whether you were a supporter of President Obama or not in that moment, he brought a lot of people in as financial donors to the system who never thought of themselves as giving money before, right? It became Pavlovian, that little red donate button on the bottom of the email. And it did feel somehow like, you know, you could make a difference with $10 or with 100 bucks. And so folks were not only standing in those long lines to vote, they were also doing that slightly higher level of participation by giving money. But if, if it feels like I'm giving $10 and, you know, Foster Freeze is giving a billion, <laughs> right? I, I worry, like, at the core about the health of the democracy, not just about the re-election of Democrats who seem to be, you know, sort of unable to get the, the seven-figure donors. Well, I think the 2000 election, when Al Gore barely lost in the, the dangling Chad, hanging Chad yeah. of Florida, that, that proved once and for all that votes matter, that registering. And right now, everybody has to register. It's not just about giving the 10. It's getting as many friends as you can to register. That's got to be a big drive, particularly in the Democratic Party right now. But the one point, and I'll just pick one issue because I care about it, the big problem that um, the Democrats sometimes have is that let's take energy. Big oil has mm -hmm. all of this money. 
who's opposing the Keystone Pipeline or drilling of Anwar? Environmental groups. Mm -hmm. They don't have the big, they're, they're struggling, the Sierra Club or Audubon Society, Wilderness Survi uh, Society to survive. So to stand up to those billions of an oil industry when you're with that. So some of the Democratic power groups that do vote, environmentalists do vote, and, 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 and they will vote probably for President Obama, they're not as good at getting that big fat money checks that you're talking about and it's a struggle for the Democratic Party. We, we are Star Wars fans in Nerdland as you <laughs> might expect and we were trying to figure out if the Democratic Party has become a bunch of Ewoks battling the, <laughs> <laughs> the much more empowered Death Star here. Yes, okay. But, uh, before we go to break